The Free National Movement, a party on the men, will hold the continuation of its national convention starting on the 23rd. Just as party officials were anxious to select a new leader in November, once former Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis led the FNM to an election defeat, there's pretty much the same excitement to choose new party officers. Touted as the hottest convention contest is the runoff for the party chairman seat. Carl Culmer, the current chairman, has hung up the chairman's hat and is ready and willing to pass on the mantle to whomever emerges as winner. Former MP for Elizabeth, Dr. Dwayne Sands, former MP for Yamacraw, Ellsworth Johnson, and former MP for Golden Gates, Michael Folks are all offering for chairman. Going into this convention, the one thing these three men all have in common is to unify the party. And what a job ahead of them. Many FNMs did not show up at the polls on election day, sending a strong message to the then leadership. Tonight, we get to meet the three contenders, Sands, Johnson, Folks. Our topic is the FNM, the race for chairmanship. Just what direction these men are proposing to take the FNM in. You're watching On the Record. I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. See you on the other side of this break. Record, we push the limits, venture into unknown territory. We take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV cable channel 212 and streaming live on Facebook on the R News Bahamas page. Welcome back to On the Record. The nation's eyes are on the Free National Movement's upcoming national convention. Even more watched is the race for chairman. Who will emerge as the winner? Well, we will just have to watch and see. Tonight, we discuss the FNM's race for chairmanship. And our guest for this segment is Dr. Dwayne Sands. He's a former Minister of Health in the Minnis administration and a cardiovascular surgeon and family man. Dr. Sands, welcome again to On the Record. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Again. <laughs> Dr. Sands, you went uh, from being fired from the, as, by the former Prime Minister to now wanting to hold one of the most coveted positions in the party. What makes you the man for the job? Well, there's a saying, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Um, I think that uh, having uh, been in the positions that I've been in in the organization, I've been able to see it in good times and in bad times. And I, I bring a level of experience, expertise, and determination to the post. Uh, the public is excited about the free national movement. They're excited about our new leader. And our new leader needs a strong team supporting him. How does one, or, or can one be an effective chairman and not be in parliament, not hold a seat um, in the House of Assembly? Absolutely. I think if you look at uh, the history of uh, the f and chairs, if you look at the history of chairs in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, uh, you will see that uh, there have been very effective uh, political chairmen uh, who have been in and out of parliament. Uh, fundamentally, the role of chairman is distinctly different than the role of the leader. The chairman is the CEO of the organization, the political party. And my goal will be, if I'm uh, elected as chairman, to make this party battle ready, to make sure that our constituency associations are ready throughout the length and breadth of the Bahamas, and that our organizations like the Women's Association and the Torchbearers 
are appropriately prepared and empowered to do what they need to do. So I want you to take a listen to this and we'll uh, get your comment on the other side. Me on the spot here, yeah. uh, but um, I guess everyone knows that uh, I'm supporting um, Dr. Dwayne Sands. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at all of the um, uh, candidates um, for 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 um, uh, chairman, um, he over the over the years have been that person that FNMs can call. It, it, um, they 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 um, can can um, uh, pick up the phone and call him. Um, he has assisted many many FNMs. Um, um, over, 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 over the. Um, he's not one to, to shun away from um, uh, a phone call, you know. And, and and my thing is, we want a job done. Give it to a person who's busy. They will find the time to do what is required uh, for for the office. Outgoing Chairman Carl Coma endorsing you. Um, does that put you uh, slightly ahead of your opponents? Does that help? In a situation like this? I'm grateful. I'm humbled by the endorsement given. I think that Carl Kalmus served through a very difficult period in the FNM's history. And, um, you know, what impact it will have on the delegates, I think we will see. Certainly, he still has uh, a significant amount of influence. And uh, I appreciate it, but I continue to work. I know that you had the endorsement of former Prime Minister uh, Hubert Ingram going into the last elections, uh, does that endorsement still stand? Do you think that will help you in any way? Look, it is impossible to diminish the significance of uh, the endorsement from perhaps one of the greatest political figures in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. That said, you need to be seen to be standing on your own two feet. And so um, I appreciate it. I am um, humbled by it. I'm grateful for it. But at the end of the day, what will Dwayne Sands do when uh, given the opportunity to serve? That is going to be the litmus test. Uh, Dr. Sands, uh, no secret, you were fired by the former prime minister. He's now out of the picture as party leader, but still involved in the party. What is your relationship like with party officers uh, who will be voting um, come February 25th? Um, and what's your relationship in general with folks in the party? I think my relationship is good. I have had my moments of glory in the party. Um, I would have been elected as deputy chairman at one point. I have seen the agony of defeat um, on more than one occasion uh, when I ran for deputy leader. Uh, perhaps the most notorious time was in 2016. Uh, but I have remained an f and I have remained committed to the cause because I think it is the political cause or the political organization that is right for the Bahamas. The voters said something different in the last election. They thought the party, um, the leadership, uh, uh, MPs, um, ministers like yourself were not the right party at the time. What are you going to do if elected to fix the party, to fix the FNM? Well, as you know, I demitted office on May the 5th, 2020. The election was September 2021. And as we were canvassing voters in the streets, we were hearing some things. Uh, we would have held an election at probably a less than ideal time. So when FNMs are disquieted or disenchanted or disgruntled, they stay home. And when you see as many as 40,000 FNM supporters that don't vote, that means that we have a problem, we've got work to do. But there's a level of enthusiasm, of optimism, of excitement now that uh, we've done some things. We've already changed the leader. We have a new leader in Michael Clifton Pintard. We're about to elect another 50 uh, party officers and the mood in the free national movement has already begun to peak. But how do you move past the last period of governance for the FNM, which obviously did not sit well with voters, when you still have a Hubert Minnis who is still um, speaking in the House of Assembly, still speaking to the media, still very much a, a player in this political game? I think um, people accept it for what it is. Uh, there are individuals who have been somewhat larger than life on the political stage. And it is probably very challenging to adjust to that new role. But adjust you will. 
adjust, you must. Uh, what will uh, have to happen is that there has to be an acknowledgement that there's a new leader, there's a new sheriff in town, and the uh, leadership of the Free National Movement is headed in the direction that is being charted by Michael Pintard, not by anybody else. One of the, uh, one of the jobs of, of a chairman um, is to speak to national issues uh, when uh, relevant, but also to, as you would have stated, um, keep the organs of the party going. Um, knowing all of these things, you are a, a surgeon, um, a very busy one, a renowned one, one of the best in the country, a family man. Um, how, uh, how, do you, how would you intend on balancing all of these things? The job of a chairman can be pretty demanding, particularly in a hot election season. You work at it. Um, I have been involved in frontline politics now since 2009. Uh, is it easy? No, it isn't easy. But it's important. You know, we have only one country. Uh, and there will be no knight in shining armor coming in to save us. All of us need to engage. Uh, when I look at my children, and there are many, uh, I want them to know that their father recognized that service to country was a critical part of paying for the privilege of existing. Um, I grew up in a house that was divided politically. My father, uh, God rest his soul or bless his soul, was a PLP. He was always politically misguided. My mother <laughs> was an FNM. And what I learned was that politics is not a blood sport, okay? Mm. Uh, but you, you provide service to church, you provide service to country, and uh, that is important. So does Dwayne Sands have a whole lot of free time? No. But I will have more than enough time to devote to this organization, to see to it that it is battle ready, to respond to the concerns of uh, FNMs, to respond to the concerns of people who want to become FNMs, and to make sure that Michael Pintard and whomever is a deputy leader has a functioning, well-oiled machine on which to launch their political uh, plans. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the PLP's term in office. Um, been in office a few months. Um, your assessment on how this government has done thus far? I think they've been flat-footed. Uh, I have been amazed in a period of four short months, the dearth of, um, of legislative work that they have done and the faux pas that they have committed. They have shot themselves in the foot over and over and over. I mean, the Dubai trip was um, to be as objective as possible was a public relations disaster. You have so many people speaking, apparently out of sync. The Prime Minister himself created this issue about quarantine that didn't have to come to the public's attention. How can the Prime Minister and the Minister of Health have three different distinct stories about whether he was in quarantine, about to go in quarantine, had broken quarantine, etc. It was a non-story that he created. And they are the gift that keeps on giving. They have given the free national movement phenomenal fodder, political fodder. Um, as, the, as the former Minister of Health, I know you would have sat around the table when certain restrictions were put into place uh, and certain things that were done. Um, a lot of them have been relaxed. Um, I understand that even we've gotten indications that even more may be relaxed. Um, but when you look at uh, where we have come, even where the world has come, um, going back to that period uh, to be way too long, um, to, to lift some of the restrictions, were they right on, on target? What would you have done differently um, had you been given the opportunity? You know, what's interesting, I, I, I see that there is the continuous tension between the various arms of the government and uh, the minister seems to be um, reasonably prudent in the approach that he's taken. If you look at the back and forth about the Dex to Daps concert and so on and so forth, it appears as if the minister is putting his foot down and uh, been the airing, case of the carnival. airing on the side of prudence and safety. Mm -hmm. The same thing with carnival. Um, I know that he is under phenomenal pressure in order to just let everything uh, go wide open. Um, we are seeing the numbers decrease. 
despite the fact that there are many people left in hospital, we've had a number of deaths. And uh, it's going to be a day-by-day, hour-by-hour assessment to determine what is the right thing to do at the right time. In your opinion, have some of these moves been the right moves at the right time? I think, um, you know, some of the moves have been reasonable. And uh, um, the one thing that, that is clear is that this particular Minister of Health seems to be listening uh, to the various voices that he's hearing. Uh, it's a difficult and challenging job balancing health balancing the economy. Uh, Talk a little bit more now about the party itself. Uh, You would have mentioned earlier about your desire to um, get the various arms of the party um, operational and in place. But from your assessment, what other things are needed to rebuild the FNM? You talk also about this momentum, but what do you think needs to happen to rebuild the party? I mean, five years is not a long time. Um, The the party has deviated from its core philosophical beliefs. Um, If you look at the tenets that um, were, if you ask somebody, what makes FNMs FNM? I think the typical refrain would be an abiding commitment to transparency, accountability, uh, integrity. And uh, that shows uh, in the way it conducts itself in governance. Um, We have gone through a period where um, it's not as easy to say that the free national movement um, is so distinct from uh, the progressive liberal party. And uh, that argument you would have heard made over and over and over. And one of the th- one of the criticisms in, uh, along those lines had to do with things like transparency and accountability. I mean, the government was accused o- accused over and over of not being transparent and not being truthful about things. The last two years, uh, when we were uh, under emergency orders, I think allowed for a number of things to happen without the ordinary discourse and sharing with the public, and that allows people to make up the stories. So, you know, people prefer to believe a simple lie and a complex truth. Um, as we now go out into the vineyards to recall persons who have left the free national movement, to welcome them back home now, they want to know that this is the organization that they grew up with, uh, or obviously modernized, that they can feel as if the integrity of the organization is intact, uh, that it is an organization that, uh, that enjoys the big tent philosophy that tolerates dissent. Uh, And I believe that we are headed right back down that road. Now you've spoken to, or or, yeah, spoken about those FNMs who may not have come out or or who feel disenfranchised, but what about those new voters? What about the the, the Gen uh, X and Z and who really have no loyalty to any party and are looking towards the future? I mean, what's your message to those voters? whether they were first-time voters in this election or will be first-time voters in the next. Jerome, we are at a uh, critical point um, in the history of the Bahamas. Uh, I equate it to the significance of 1967 and 1992 and the need for a revolution uh, in the Bahamas, a peaceful revolution, uh, where young people can now say that there is uh, something in this country for me Um, is really the critical job of a Michael Pintard-led free national movement undergirded by a strong uh, executive team. So when we go now to those young people, the 18, uh, 20, 25, 30-year-olds, they've got to know that it is better to stay in the Bahamas because we believe and understand that opportunities have to be made for them, that opportunities for education, for housing, for careers, not jobs, that the, the concept of a livable wage uh, makes some sense to a free national movement administration. That we are not about big government and taxing everybody in order to give away money, but uh, showing people how to, uh, to, to, to earn a living, showing people how the entrepreneurial route makes some sense. And it is a paradigm 
that has to be introduced into governance and into this country if we are going to survive. Final question. Um, I know that it has been discussed with, within many circles, uh, within the party and on the outside, but uh, do you personally aspire to be leader of the party? You know that question. And Prime Minister? That question has been asked of me many times. On this show as well. You've <laughs> asked me this. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, Dwayne Sands does not need to be Prime Minister or leader in order to be self-actualized. Um, I am quite happy being best supporting actor. I, I like to use the metaphor of the 1980s Bulls, okay? Uh, Michael Jordan was a superstar but couldn't win a championship until he got a Scottie Pippen. I will be Michael Pintard's Scottie Pippen. People who born after the 90s don't know that <laughs> reference. <laughs> I got you on that. Dr. Sands, thank you. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Best of luck to you. Uh, thank you so much um, for being with us this evening. And again, uh, best of luck in your bid for chairmanship. We're going to take a quick break right here. And when we come back, we're going to be joined by candidate Ellsworth Johnson. We are discussing the FNM's race for chairmanship. We're going to see you on the other side of the break. season of On the Record, we push the limits. Venture into unknown territory. We take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the Record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV cable channel 212 and streaming live on Facebook on the R News Bahamas page. There are certain realities that we have to remove from the FNM if we want to be a party of choice for the people. And that is, we're a party that accepts all, not a party for the affluent and for the rich. Powerful words. Welcome back to On the Record. We are discussing the FNM, the race for chairmanship. And our guest in this segment is the former Minister of Immigration and Investment, uh, also, a uh, an attorney, Ellsworth Johnson. Welcome back to On the Record, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, Pleasure to be here. In this clip that we just aired, we showed you um, at the point of nominating. You mentioned that the FNM should be a party for all and not just for the rich and affluent. Is this how you feel the party is perceived, or do you plan? And how do you plan to go about changing it if that is in fact the perception, whether real or imagined? First, again, thank you for having me here. Uh, there is, we have to create the environment, as was done by our illustrious leader, our first leader, successor, when he break, when the party broke away from the other party, to create the environment where every Bahamian, uh, regardless of their social or economic standing, know and feel that they have a stake uh, in the free national movement and that we truly believe uh, in their dreams and their aspirations. And unless and until we can do that, where we have the respect for every individual coming in and removing that specter, uh, there will be a, a difficulty. And I believe and I know that under the leadership of uh, Michael C. C. Pintard, uh, the message that he's preaching of unity in the party respecting the views of all, regardless to where they may find themselves in the Bahamas, whether the family islands or Nassau, we were able to do that. Ide identifying with the socio-economic uh, difficulties that people are facing. We face two enormous challenges in Hurricane Dorian and uh, uh, the COVID-19 crisis, which is resulted in, resulting now, not in only the, the loss of life, but resulting in inflation in terms of how people live and eat and with the introduction of uh, taxes on bread basket items. 
we must be able to identify with the difficulties that people are facing. And they must see uh, the free national movement as a center of excellence, every one of his constituency associations that understand and believe in people. The good book says, you know, you can go never to attempt to preach the gospel where people don't have some of the basic necessities in life. They're not going to believe it. And, say, and so to the extent that we, we must then be able to look at the family islands, to look at seniors, to look at women's issues, I believe that every uh, party in the Bahamas should be tuning in on violence against women, to look at the issues of women, the youth in our community and see how we can cause them in accordance with our constitution, and most certainly the constitution of the free national movement, to realize their dreams and their aspirations. How does one, though, <clears throat> pardon me, go from um, an election defeat, uh, a, a defeat in the constituency, to now coming to the party and saying, hey, put me in this position of prominence? I mean, how, how does one make that transition um, and be able to, to garner support? It's all about service. Servant leadership. Service. Uh, I've been saying to persons in the party and also the leader that governments are blessed by the master and also the opposition, even through our constitution, it established a, a loyal opposition and that is to check power, raw power, and to ensure that the civil liberties of all and the right to self-determine in the Bahamas is protected. And so to come to persons to say, I wasn't su su successful in the election. I'm coming now to run. I have to be able to look them in their eyes, to identify with their disposition or how they feel about the Bahamas or how they feel they've been disadvantaged. And they must come to believe that I have a true interest in that. You can't fool people. Mm -hmm. And so that is the way that you would do it. And once people believe that you have their best interest in, at heart, especially in the party, the Women's Association, the MCMs, the former uh, leaders of the party, whether it be Mr. Ingram, a former prime minister, or Mr. Mr. Minnis, identifying with the goals, aspirations, uh, and characteristics that spawn uh, the, the move by successful and others to refute or to remove themselves from the Progressive Liberal Party and create the free national movement to cause people to identify with that dream and that vision that has caused us to have a, 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 a free media the development in the family islands, the protection of women and children, and all of the legislation that we have brought to. It, it assists in, in doing that. So people have to come. You're dealing with people. That's what politics is about, as it, at its lowest common denominator. It is how you share the scarce resources in the community. And so every element in the party, where they, whether they be behind the gate, or they're in Balls Alley, or they're in Cat Island, or they're in North or South Andros, or in Freeport, or in especially in Abaco, where they're being devastated, must understand that, listen, I fall within this category, and I matter. And to the extent uh, that they matter, they're prepared to serve, unwillingly. How do you intend on really uh, moving the party forward towards the next general election? The, the chairman uh, serves a very pivotal role within the party and the running of the party. Yes. Um, but. If given the opportunity, how then, or what are your plans really to begin moving the party towards 2026? Respect. Respect for every person in the party. The chairman must restore and, re and fortify the whole concept of communication and consultation. The gentleman on the back line is just as important as the leader servant leadership, respecting all entities in the party. There are different interests in every party, right? And we must recognize them, recognize their, their right to be in the party uh, and, and, and to serve the party. And so the chairman must, like a good quarterback, uh, a good point guard, be able to understand that he's not a one-man band. Mm. He must respect the constitution of the party, he must create the environment where, like I said, I always take it back to people. We're dealing with people. It's almost like building a beautiful home, uh, putting every amenity in that home. And we've had some good successes in this government. When you look at the Public Procurement Act, what we did with energy generation by refurbishing the whole BPL, we don't have fires at the dump anymore, and a number of things. 
Thousands of persons were at home, but we were still paying them a salary. We made great sacrifice, and I'm coming back to what I, the illustration I was making. But if persons don't believe and appreciate that you have their best interests at heart, just like a man who may build a nice home and his wife is gone because she doesn't feel loved and respected, you will have the very same thing. We have to create that in our membership. For those who feel disenchanted uh, and who are, who are now not want to be involved in the party, we have to say that you're welcome and you can come back. But um, uh, as I said, all must feel, regardless of their, regardless of their socio-economic standing, that they have a role to play. And there are many people, so we must identify with their issues, with the people who have been sent home, persons who are losing contracts, uh, those, for instance, Mr. Russell, the former director of immigration, is at home. How do we deal with those situations? And so the party has to be able to do that, and the party must sell itself that it believes in people, and that's what it's all about. Where did that, or when did that disconnect happen, in your opinion, uh, when you all were in office? I mean, you would have heard the cries of the people um, going to the polls and even afterwards that they, they, there was a disconnect and the, the misery index was so high. What happened now, you know, uh, when did that disconnect start or, or happen? We worked extremely hard, I must say that. We faced uh, two devastating events. One which I've uh, compared to five states in the U.S. being totally uh, obliterated, Freeport uh, and Abaco with the Hurricane Dorian, and then with COVID-19 being led by the science, that's what we were led by. And what we experience in terms of the min misery index is not only endemic to the Bahamas, if you look around the world, as governments struggle to deal with COVID-19, as we struggle, as a matter of fact, we, uh, in terms of the ministry that I was responsible for, we were able to digitize the entire public service. Immigration went online. There are a number of things we were able to do. But in, we got some things right, we got some things wrong. But in the context in which we found ourselves, uh, we just had to make certain adjustments. And then you can't, you had an opposition, which was saying open. When you open, they said close. When you said close, they said open. Open the bars. And they, would be, uh, they were there doing certain things that caused certain things not to go our way. And so we have to reach out. We have to re-strategize. And we have to readjust and reach out to persons. But now, as the new government is, in, uh, is now governing, you're seeing all of the benefits. They're not removing all of the strategies or the policies that we were putting in place. And we have to improve most significantly on our PR, and that's one of the things that we have to address. All of the progresses that we have made, we have to highlight them, celebrate them. And as, for instance, in immigration, they're now doing promotions. Well, I reviewed those. Strategic, we did a strategic analysis of all the promotions. There's no way you could come into government in less than two months. You would have done all the vettings for all these persons. And for persons who hadn't gotten confirmatory letters, letters for more than 10 years, you're just able to do that? No, I can tell you that was done. And persons in the ministry know that. In terms of the digitization... So why weren't they done? Pardon me? Why weren't they done? You said, you know, coming in, you got two... There's no way they would have reviewed and gotten all these things done in two months. But why weren't they done well, under, the, under your administration? They were completed. We were in the middle of a crisis. We, whether right or wrong, we call the SNAP election and focusing on people, the way how we could address certain issues that persons were facing. That was it. For instance, when I speak when I spoke about total digitization of department, persons experienced that. Uh, and so some of perhaps we didn't get it right in terms of saying what we had accomplished. And so in terms of the strategic analysis that we will now do internally. Those are some of the things that we have to address as a party. I want to go back to your reference to the Progressive Liberal Party. They are touted as one of the strongest oppositions in the region. Should you win the chairmanship, um, do you plan on bringing the FNM up to the level um, that the Progressive Liberal Party was at in opposition? They were a very strong and unrelenting opposition. Tribalistic tribalistic, and you can see it now that they're now the government, dealing 
in the most brutish forms of uh, discrimination, victimization, and ostracization of the Bahamian people. As a matter of fact, one can say, and rightly so, if you're not seen as a progressive Liberal Party supporter, you're not almost not seen as a Bahamian. Uh, we are a strong party. It's the strength of persons like Cecil and the Dissident Eight that led us to leave that group. It is the strength of this party that conducted a commission of inquiry in the 80s to expose some of the things that was being done. It was the strength of this party that now creates the environment for you to sit here by the opening of the airwaves. It was the strength of that party that dealt with children regardless of their socioeconomic or their birth status and passed legislation to protect them. It was that party that dealt with the Freedom of Information Act and, and appointed a Freedom of Information Committee. So it was that our party, the strength of our party, allowed a Miles LaRota, even though we knew of his political persuasion, to be sure that he can do the job to continue to work on a number of other uh, appointments. It is the strength of this party. So yes, the PLP are strong in certain areas, as I outlined as I first began. And I've had the, 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 the opportunity recently to confront Mr. Mitchell on his uh, view of women and how he treated them and how he treats them and how he speaks to the media. So it's the strength of this party that we have demonstrated and we're going to continue on that course. Do you still stand behind those comments, support those comments to Mr. Mitchell? They were made on another show and uh, created quite a, a, a controversy. Yes. I, listen, I know that a comment was made. And when I look in the dictionary, there's a definition for that comment. And I, I was clear when I made that comment as to what I spoke to. I was the first minister in government to meet with the gay and lesbian community. I was the first president of Obama's Human Rights Network. I have family members and friends who are of a certain persuasion. But I know this one fact, that God loves us all. And one of the greatest choices, things that we've been given is the right of choice. And so, taken out of context, yes, uh, what I said, but I stand by the fact that no man should be disrespectful and discourteous to women. And I stand by the fact that the entity, the fourth estate, that really serves to undergird freedom and the constitutional viability of any government should not be attacked for doing their job. We are running out of time, and I've got to ask you this question. I want your assessment on how the Progressive Liberal Party ha has done as government in these past few months. You know, to the extent that they're taking, trying to take credit for what we have done, uh, when you look at the port development and a number of other things that we have done, the promotional exercises, uh, I think uh, they've not done very well. Uh, to the extent that they've canceled hundreds of contracts and sent even some of their supporters home, uh, they've not done very well. As well the, this, an argument could be made that the FNM would have done the same thing when coming so, to office. Not so. You refute that. I refute that. And Minister Roll unequivocally denied it and demanded that they show that it was done. Not so. Not so. They're good on propaganda, normally good in opposition with spewing all sorts of vile nonsense. Even the former Chief Justice, Mr. Hartman Longley, spoke about the protection of judges, that you don't demonize them or threaten them with imprisonment. And they did that, especially people who know better, right? That's what they're able to do in opposition. But governance, very poor. Well, Attorney Ellsworth Johnson, uh, we wish you all the best in your bid to be chairman. We hope to see you back here again uh, if you are um, successful Thank and you. do um, emerge as, as victor. Uh, we are discussing the FNM, the race to chairmanship. We will return. Our guest is Attorney Michael Folks, who is also vying for this top post. We'll see you on the other side of the break. Stay with us. season of On the Record, we push the limits, venture into unknown territory. We take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the Record, 
Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV Cable Channel 212 and streaming live on Facebook on the R News Bahamas page. And welcome back to On the Record. We are now in the final segment of the show. We are discussing the FNM, the race to chairmanship with candidate Michael Folks. Mr. Folks was the former member of parliament for Golden Gates. Welcome, sir, to On the Record. This is your first time joining us in here. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, glad, yes, it is. Glad to have you with us. You come from what we call FNM royalty with the last name Folks. Your father is one of the founding fathers of the party. Does that put any pressure on you in, in any way? Well, I know, um, first of all, Jerome, thank you very much for having me on the show. And as you say, um, this is my first time on the show, and I'm very pleased to be here. And, um, you know, you have a very good show. Thank you. A very popular you. show, and it's a well-watched show. And I congratulate you and your team. Thank you I know very much. Everything requires a team. Yeah, it sure does. You they, may not see the team, they, but the they team is the there. foundation. I'm exactly. just the face. <laughs> exactly. So I want to commend you and commend the team thank you. For, for the wonderful show. Um, let me say first of all that um, uh, I think it's more about service, um, the family members who have been involved previously. I think it's more about their service um, in the party and service in the country. And um, I have come up the party, um, starting out as a torch bearer mm -hmm. uh, in the early days, some, some time ago now, as a, as a young man, as a teenager in the torch bearers, and um, uh, been serving the party in various posts over the years. Um, at the constituency level as council rep, where uh, the action is really, it's closest to the people. And the constituency associations are really the backbone of the party and the base of the party. That's where the strength of the party is. Um, uh, Deputy Secretary General of the party and Secretary General serve in, under um, three of the leaders uh, between the two posts, uh, Tommy Turnquist, uh, the Right Honorable Hubert Ingram, and the Most Honorable Hubert Minnis. And so, um, it's, it's been about um, service in the party and by extension service in the country and um, yes um, others and my family have done the same thing yes mm -hmm. our <coughs> producer this week interviewed now outgoing chairman Carl Kulmer uh, asked what qualities he wanted to see <coughs> in a chairman let's take a look at how he responded like I said earlier uh, um, the, the chairmanship is not uh, just a camera a lights um, position it's a position where you, you need to be able to help, and sometimes you need to put your hands in your pocket and assist um, persons, because not every time someone calls, there's uh, available cash mm -hmm. for you. So uh, you need a, a chairperson who can, who can assist. Uh, you don't need a chairperson who's going to be um, running away from the phone. You know, there's some folks who, who um, uh, run for office. Uh, during my, my, my tenure as chairman, I could not even get them. Uh, to 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 um, as a minister, uh, but there were some that I could pick up the phone and get them right away. Mm -hmm. uh, if I if um, they missed my call, uh, uh, they would they would they would return a call. So interesting. He said yes. that as the minister administration was known, especially by members of the press, for sorely lacking when it came to communicating and simply answering phone calls. Do you see yourself as one of those uh, persons described by Kalman? Let me say this, uh, broadly speaking, um, I think the work of the chairman is a lot of work. There's no question. Um, especially after a devastating loss, there's no question. There's a lot of work to be done. And so <clears throat> uh, persons who are seeking the position certainly ought to be persons who intend uh, to, to get the work done and do the work. There's a lot of work to be done at the association level, as I said earlier. Uh, working closely hand in hand with all the organs of the party, the youth association, the women association, and you know uh, there are other uh, organs, so to speak, not officially recognized, like uh, all the former cabinet ministers. That's really an organ of the party, for all intents and purposes. The former uh, backbenchers, they are organs of the party. Uh, they may not be formally recognized in the constitution, but they are organs of the party, nonetheless. And so there's a lot of work to be done uh, in terms of working with, uh, directly with all the organs of the party to rebuild the party and strengthen the party. Um, and, and that is my theme. My theme is strengthening our party because our party needs to be strengthened. And something else he said there, uh, communication. 
in my view, and I've said this often, communication is critical up and down the organization. And so while communication uh, tends often to flow down from here down to the association level and the organ levels, more importantly, the information needs to flow up uh, because that is how, uh, how you know where you are uh, in the public because mm -hmm. the people on the ground are nearest to the voters. Sure. And so uh, if, we have, if we don't have that communication, then what we have is a disconnect, essentially. And so communication, broadly speaking, is critically important in every respect throughout the organization. And that's why I've said we need to welcome everybody. We need to involve everybody. This is the only way we're going to strengthen the party and unify the party. We, are definitely, um, we definitely need to put a lot of effort and energy into unifying the party. And as I've said when I, when I was uh, nominated, I said I would make every effort that I can by the grace of God to help to unify this party in every respect. Well, um, you would have mentioned, sir, the <coughs> devastating loss, as you called it, um, yes. mm -hmm. um, that the party suffered at the polls. <coughs> and yes. in order to, you know, after every election, um, you have to begin to do some kind of assessment right. um, and figure out what happened. Uh, should you take up the position, I mean, how, uh, should, should you win this, the position, pardon me, right. um, how do you intend to address some of those things that would have led to the party's loss at the polls? Yes, yeah. and that's a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Jerome, let me say this. Um, we know that w the question often is asked, why did the party lose? Mm -hmm. well, um, the first answer that we know, which is the party lost as many seats as it did because a uh, number of our supporters did not come out to the polls to vote. So the next question is, why did they not come out? And so um, the leader, uh, Michael Pintard, uh, who was elected who I fully support, um, he's made it uh, clear that uh, he intends uh, to have, have it studied, uh, data-driven, in an empirical way. Because as we know, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence as to why uh, people did not come out, particularly our supporters, why our supporters did not come to the poll and vote for the FNM candidate in their constituency. And so there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. And so that is important. But what we can also do, because of the, the process we use in the elections in every constituency, we do have uh, an ability to also go directly uh, to determine those persons who may not have voted and to go to them directly and speak to them directly and get direct evidence from them, so to speak, because it is critically important going forward and preparing for 2026, because at the end of the day, this one's about, it's about winning in 2026 and strengthening the party to do so. And so at the end of the day, it is critically important to know why they did not come out to vote and to fix it as best we can, and to listen to our supporters. And this is one thing we need to do more. We need to go out and we need to listen to our supporters. And the full breadth, length and breadth of this country, from Abaco in the north to Abaco, to, pardon me, to Anago in the south and in between. And you know, I just say very quickly, we say Abaco in the north, but it really means all of Abaco. For mm -hmm. example, Grand Key is north of uh, Little Abaco, Fox Sound, Crown Haven. As you probably know, you have to get a boat to go there. I've been there several times. Uh, uh, Tradition has been an FM stronghold, and we actually have a, uh, an MCM from there, Manager's Council member. So when we say that, we really mean even keys where we have a lot of supporters, and that's very important. We don't intend to leave out anybody, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the way I see it, as chairman, uh, we really need to get on the ground in New Providence, in Grand Bahama, and all of the family islands. And we need to talk to our people. We need to hear what their frustrations are, and we need to respond to them. We need to listen to them. and. Um, find out um, and determine from them how they think it's best for us to go forward, moving forward, what are the things we need to do, again, to win in 2026. Now, you talked about reaching your supporters, and yes. I, I would think that that is your base. Yes. Uh, and, and solidifying the base is important, because yes. in order to for any party anywhere to <clears throat> move forward, you must have a strong base. Yes. But um, the numbers would show in tradition would show that it really, uh, it's those swing voters yes. that that help to sway an election. It's those people who, you know, move from party to party in an election that determine the outcome. How do you intend to reach those voters who, you know, evidence will show, have cast their vote and are supporting the PLD? Yeah. Uh, the thing is, in the first instance, you do not win an election without an energized base. You're not going to win an election if your base of your support is not energized. And so the first thing we need to do 
is to energize the base of the party. Uh, the party's not going to have a whole lot of chances of being successful if we don't energize the base. And so, uh, but having said that, you're quite right. Uh, it goes beyond just energizing the base. You're quite right, Jerome. And so, uh, it is a two-part process or two-track, and you run in, you're running both tracks at the same time. Uh, but in the first instance, leading off your first question, and the first thing we need to do is to find out why people our people didn't come out to vote. Uh, I think that's uh, critical, and uh, Michael Pintar, our leader, has said that, and I think uh, he's, he's, he's very much spot on, he's right, and I fully support that. And I said, as I said, um, there are many ways we can do it, and we have to do that. That's mm -hmm. absolutely critical, um, because um, you need to know where did you go wrong so that you can fix it. Uh, now, um, I want, I've asked this of, of the two previous candidates mm -hmm. um, who were just here, your assessment of this government's performance in office to date? Blackluster. Blackluster at best. Uh, I was uh, on a show recently and I was saying it's lackluster at best. In fact, uh, I am very, very deeply concerned as to um, where we are now in this country. Let me tell you, um, Jerome, uh, I've called on the minister, uh, Obi Wilchcombe, the minister for social services and urban renewal. Uh, to look at all of these terminations that they have done in urban renewal, uh, all of these terminations where people have not been paid, they've not been paid their uh, notice pay, they've not been paid their vacation, they've not been paid gratuity. People were let go just before Christmas, Jerome, given a letter, but not given monies that were due them. And this is the government. If, if, it were in private, it was, if it were in a private company, um, they'd be able to file actions. Uh, for not being properly compensated. And here it is, we have the government, not only in social services, where the Ministry of Social Services Urban um, Renewal, where they're letting people go. And uh, these people are struggling. They have difficulty um, making their, uh, meeting their bills. They have difficulty putting food on the table. And I can tell you this, and I know this from direct evidence, because our leader, uh, Michael Pentard, he had set up a help desk in the headquarters so that we can assist those persons. And uh, I participated in that as, as one of the lawyers in the party. And uh, I spoke to a lot of them. I mean, this is direct evidence from them. And uh, they are really having a hard time. They're struggling. And uh, in addition to that, Jerome, they did not only uh, terminate these people wrongfully. Uh, they also closed many of the offices. Today, the centers, many of the centers are closed to this day. And these centers, um, they provide a critical and important service to the communities that they serve, and a lot of them are closed in New Providence. And just two weeks ago, they closed the Pine Ridge office center in Grand Bahama, and a number of them are closed to this day in, um, in the Family Islands. And so I call on the minister to remedy and fix these situations. Now, if memory serves me, uh, the FNM would have been accused of letting quite a few people go following the election, uh, mm -hmm. um, following the last election <coughs> or when the party came to office. I mean. Uh, and it's something we hear over and over. Every time a government changes, we <coughs> hear the same story. So what makes this scenario different from the FNM scenario? Well, I, well, I can tell you, I, I heard a response from the government when this issue was raised. And the, the minister under the FNM, uh, Honorable Brenzel Roll, made it very clear in a, in a statement um, to the media that uh, what they have done, we did not do. And I accept what, what Minister Roll said. Uh, what they have done, we, we, we did not do. We did not do, and so, uh, but, but, but quite apart from that, uh, we're in a particularly difficult period now, because we're in a pandemic, and it's very difficult to find jobs in this pandemic. Uh, it is very difficult for a number of reasons, and which brings me to, to, to the other big issue, I think, and, and this is the cost of living. Uh, the cost of living, as we know, is going through the roof, and Bayman families are finding it very difficult to put food on the table, at a time when this government decided to put tax on, uh, put, the VAT, uh, put VAT on breadbasket items. Not only breadbasket items, we always say breadbasket items, but do not forget, it's also insurances, uh, insurance uh, policies, and there's also um, prescriptions, medical uh, prescriptions. And those are especially needed by our vulnerable community, our elderly persons, uh, senior citizens, uh, our precious pearls, and it is making life difficult, and people literally cannot afford food in the, in, in, in the food store. It has become very, very difficult. And you know, I heard um, the, the, the minister, uh, Michael Alkides, 
uh, talking about, speaking to the issue of what can the government do. Well, there's a couple of things they can do. First of all, they can remove the VAT off of breadbasket items. They can remove it off uh, prescription uh, medication. They can remove, remove it off insurances. Secondly, what they can do is that they can increase the amount of uh, food assistance to persons who are receiving food assistance, because clearly the money they were getting before is not the same value now with the high cost. So they can do that. And thirdly, what they can do, uh, and that is uh, the unemployment assistance ended um, that the FNM government put in place for workers uh, that lost their jobs during, during the pandemic. And uh, that ended uh, December 31st. What they can do is resume that, and they can do all of these things right now. They can do them today. They can do them today. They can do them tomorrow if they so choose. So there are a lot of things that they can. As he said, there aren't many things in the toolbox. Well, well, that's not so. That's clearly not so. There are a lot of tools in the toolbox. The question is, are they interested in employing those tools, putting those tools to work for the benefit of struggling Bahamians? And, you know, and, 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 and this is an important point because even with the, uh, as we spoke about the urban renewal workers, remember too, they're, they're all Bahamians. They may perceive them to be of a certain party. They may perceive them to be FNMs. They may perceive a lot of things. But at the end of the day, they're Bahamians who are struggling. Just like many of the families are struggling now, generally speaking, with the, with the high cost of food. And there are things this government can do. I seen the paper this morning, uh, the Honorable Minister Obi Wills come again saying that they're going to take a look at what they can do. Well, I just gave them three things they could do. They could do those tomorrow. They can do those tomorrow. Those things are within their power to do them if they want to do. To give the baby people relief. Interesting. Much needed relief. Michael, folks, thank you so very much for joining us uh, on the record. This is your first time with us. Uh, yes. Certainly, we wish you uh, all the best in your bid for chairman, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take our final break and be right back in a minute with more on the record. Stay with us. Every new season of On the Record, we push the limits. Venture into unknown territory. We take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the Record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV Cable Channel 212 and streaming live on Facebook on the R News Bahamas page. And welcome back to On the Record. Our guests this evening, Dr. Dwayne Sands, Ellsworth Johnson, and Michael Folks. They all have one thing in common. They want to be chairman of the Free National Movement. And at the end of the day, on February 25th, one of these three will emerge as the winner, and the party will start its transition. We wish all of the candidates good luck. On a much sadder note, our technical director, Aiken Barr, says goodbye to us. He is the original director of On The Record and in so many ways the backbone of this show, keeping the host and producer in line. Aiken, we wish you well in your new endeavors and we want you to know you will never be a stranger to this place. Having said that, tune in next Thursday for another discussion on matters that directly affect the lives of Bahamians. Until then, I'm your host, Jerome Sawyer. See you next time.